Welcome to the Contending for the Word podcast, a podcast devoted to helping inform, educate, equip, and warn people about false teachers, false movements, and unbiblical philosophies. Now join our host for today's episode and enjoy. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the Contending for the Word podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm your host for today's episode. And it is so good to be back recording on this show. Uh, we have a great episode uh, ahead today. Uh, we're going to be talking and looking at Joel Olstein and his uh, concerning theology, uh, many aspects of it. And uh, I, I, before we get started on that, uh, I want to let you know uh, where we're headed. Uh, so today we're going to look at Joel Olstein, and then uh, on June 25th, uh, I get to, the privilege of inviting uh, Michelle Leslie, our friend. Um, she has been on Equipping You in Grace before, but she's never been on this show. And uh, we're going to have a great conversation um, about identifying uh, false teaching. And then uh, July 2nd, uh, Don and I have a, a really a big episode planned uh, talking about a really important topic that uh, you'll no doubt want to know about. And then uh, July 9th, I get to invite uh, my friend Daniel Chapman on. Uh, Daniel is a great friend of the show and of Servants of Grace in general, and so I'm excited to have him on. Uh, July 16th, I get to invite uh, my friend and fellow Servants of Grace contributor, Angela Mitchell of Raising Apologists, and uh, she's going to talk about her ministry. And then on July 23rd, uh, I'm going to have my wife, Sarah, who is also the managing editor of Servants of Grace. Uh, she's going to come on and she's going to actually share uh, her testimony of how she came to faith in Jesus Christ. And if you've never uh, heard my wife talk on Equipping and Grace, well, I encourage you uh, to tune into that episode because um, it is going to be really insightful. And then um, as we head out uh, the the rest of July and in August, um, I'm still working on those episodes. But uh, you can rest assured uh, there's going to be a, a good mix of uh, of of um, episodes where I'm covering a false teacher or a movement or ideology and then and or interviewing somebody or having a discussion with somebody about um, a really important matter. So uh, let's get into our episode now today. So as I mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about Joel Olstein and as I always do at the start of these episodes, I like to I like to explain the influence of the person. And uh, so Joel Olstein has 27 million followers on uh, Facebook. He has 10 million followers on Twitter. He has 5.5 million followers on Instagram. He has 3.47 million subscribers on YouTube. By the way, he is also regularly in at least the top 10, if not the top 20 podcasts, you know, on um any of the podcast ch charts like Apple and Spotify and many others. And so uh, what that means is that he has tens of thousands, if not more thousands people following his, you know, podcast, the things that he's teaching. And so this is definitely somebody that has a large influence. And it, just so that I, we're clear here on this show, this is an, there's no personal attacks here on on contending for the word. I, I do not allow personal attacks. Um, instead, what we're doing is we're doing what Jude three says. We're contending uh, for the word. We're contending for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. We're doing what First Peter three fifteen says to always be ready to give an answer for the reason for the hope that we have and do it with gentleness and respect. Uh, we're doing what 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25 tells us to do and uh, correct opponents with gentleness. And so uh, what that what that means very practically in what I'm saying is is that there's no personal attacks here. This is not personal about uh, Joel Olstein. It, it doesn't we're not attacking his person, but we are um, interacting with his theology, what he believes and what he teaches. Um, 
with a view to help you become a better student and a better Berean of the Word of God as Acts 17.11 tells us to do and as uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us to test all things and to hold fast to what is good that is in the Word of God alone. And so uh, I've got some examples that we're going to look at. The, the first one is Joel Olstein talking and then uh, Steve Lawson responding to that. And so uh, let's take a look at that now. If you're Jewish or Muslim and you don't accept Christ, they're wrong, aren't they? Well, Jesus. I don't know if I believe they're wrong. I've spent a lot of time in India with my father. You know, I don't know all about their religion, but I know they love God. Larry King, we've had ministers on our program who said, if you believe in Christ, you're going to heaven. And if you don't, you ain't. Yeah, I, I don't know. King, what if you're Jewish? What if you're a Muslim and you don't accept Christ? I don't know. King, if you believe you have to believe in Christ, they're wrong aren't they? I don't know if I believe they're wrong. I don't know about all their religion, but I know they love God. I've seen their sincerity on worldwide television. I don't know. Give us some men who know the truth and who will declare the truth. Well, amen to what uh, Steve Lawson just said and uh, that other clip of Joel Olstein talking as we're going to see here in just a minute, is actually from an interview that Joel Olstein did with Larry King, um, which we're going to get to in, in just a minute. But, you know, yeah, we, we need men of the truth today. We need men who are unafraid and women who are unafraid, uh, who, have, who are putting the fear of man to death and proclaiming the glories of the Lord Jesus in all of life, that salvation is is restricted and exclusive to only those who repent to believe in the lord jesus christ as we're going to talk about here in a minute but uh there's another uh clip that i have uh this time again of joel Osteen talking and then rc sprawl uh that great theologian um he he is uh, was the founder of legionnaire unfortunately he uh, passed now a few years ago but uh, he, he had a great response to uh, Joel's theology. So let's look at that now. I must say, I am not a poverty minister. I can't find one place in the scripture where we are supposed to drag around not having enough, not able to afford what we want, living off the leftovers, living in the land of not enough. No, we were created to be the head and not the tail. Jesus came that we might live an abundant life. They think they can improve upon the gospel. They think they can edit the gospel. They think that they can change the gospel and move to another gospel, but there is no other gospel. Yet there's some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. If we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be anathema. No stronger word in the Greek. Let him be anathema. Let him be damned. Let the curse of God come upon anyone who preaches any other gospel. Yeah, that is uh, a powerful clip with our, Dr. R.C. Sproul, um, and he is so right. There is no other gospel. There's no other message that, that can save sinners, uh, and we need to be saved. We need to see our great need of Christ and the salvation that only Christ can provide. So Dr. R.C. Sproul is absolutely correct. Um, and by the way, these uh, those first two clips, they came from our friend and sister in Christ, uh, Hasty Gomez, uh, biblically, Biblical and Reformed. Uh, she has a great Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, she posts great quotes and videos and much more. So I encourage you to check out uh, the work that she's doing. Um, it's great. So uh, now we're going to actually hear... Uh, more of that conversation that Larry had with Joel Olstein on Larry King's show. And then uh, Dr. John MacArthur will come in uh, at the end and offer a response, a rebuttal uh, to, uh, to actually uh, Joel Olstein. So here's that clip now. Now, what do you mean by that? I don't well, because uh, we've had ministers on who said, your record don't count. You either believe in Christ or you don't. If you believe in Christ, you are, you are going to heaven, and if you don't, no matter what you've done in your life, yeah. you ain't. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, there's probably a, a balance between, I believe you have to know Christ, but I think that if you know Christ, if you're a believer in God, you're going to have some good works. And I think it's a cop-out to say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't ever do anything to help well, What anybody. if you're Jewish or Muslim and you... 
don't accept Christ at all. You know, I, I just, I'm very careful about saying who and would and wouldn't go to heaven. I don't know. I think only God. If you believe, you have to believe in Christ. I believe. They're it. wrong. They well, people. I don't know if I believe they're wrong. I believe here's what the Bible teaches. And from the Christian faith, this is what I believe. But I just think that only God can judge a person's heart. I've spent a lot of time in India with my father. And, you know, I don't know all about their religion. But I know they love God. And I don't know. I'd have to, you know, I've seen their sincerity. So... I don't know. I just, I know for me and what the Bible teaches, I want to have a relationship with Jesus. But John MacArthur, what happens when you die? Well, when you die, uh, you go to one of two places, according to Scripture. You go out of the presence of God forever, or you go into the presence of God forever. Depending? Depending upon your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which is, according to the Bible, the only way to enter heaven. So therefore, a Jew or a Muslim or a Buddhist will not go to heaven. Yeah, Christian theology and the scripture says that only through faith in Jesus Christ. And you, and then when we say what happened, what happens? Do you go somewhere as a body? Is it... Yeah, no, your, your body stays. We go to the funeral, we see the body, it goes into the grave, it decays. Your spirit immediately goes either in the presence of God or out, waiting the final resurrection. There will be a resurrection of all bodies in the end, a resurrection unto life or a resurrection unto damnation. But you don't know. You don't know, no, do you? How can you know? Because the Bible says so, and I well, believe, believe the Bible. Well, I believe the Bible, but I believe the Bible can be defended. I believe through the centuries the Bible has stood the test of intense scrutiny, and it is the real and true revelation of God, and it speaks truly about life and death. And someone has been there and come back, and that's Jesus Christ. Well, Dr. MacArthur is absolutely correct. Um, there is only one way to know the Lord God, and that is as he's revealed himself in the 66 books that constitute the Word of God. And we can even say further that the whole point, the whole message, the apex, the goal, uh, the climax, if you will, of the, the Word of God is the person and work of Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelation and everywhere in between, we see the person, we see the work of, of Jesus Christ alone and the salvation that he alone provides. Uh, we see that starting in Genesis 3.15, the first gospel, and, and so much more. We see Jesus uh, proclaiming the gospel on the road to Emmaus. We see the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 and in the narratives and the law and the prophets uh, and the gospels and the epistles um, all over the Bible. In every nook and cranny of the word of God, uh, Jesus is declaring his, uh, the word of God rather is declaring uh, the, the glories of Christ from the revealed word. And so uh, we have to absolutely understand um, the, the central truth that the Bible proclaims about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, there's it's seven times in the Gospel of John, uh, John uses those I am statements. It, this, the, these statements, they take us back to Exodus 3.14, uh, when God says to Moses, I am who I am. And, and God is saying to us in the Gospel of John, um, he is saying uh, with those I am statements, God, Jesus has come in the flesh. He is, he is the God man, uh, truly God and truly man. And uh, he had come under uh, to, to die in the place of sinners. Um, and and he, has, he has done that. John 19.30 is very clear that uh, Jesus' work is finished. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 declares that Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again, he appeared to many witnesses, um, and that Jesus Christ is coming to judge the living and the dead. And so uh, this, is, this is absolutely critical, uh, critical. This, this is not a secondary matter. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that this is the gospel. This is of first importance. This is this is of crit a critical category. Um, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to God, if you think that there are many ways to God, um, you cannot be a Christian. Uh, and and out there today is it's not even just by the way it's not even just out there in the world which is what Larry King is is really talking about it's actually in the walls of our churches 
um, every other year, uh, the Ligonier, Ligonier Ministries, which uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul founded, uh, they do a survey called the State of Theology. And this uh, survey uh, surveys American Christians and what they believe about the Bible, salvation, about God, and so much more. And so this particular aspect of the survey, um, it, it asks people about salvation being only through Jesus Christ alone. And the survey came back and says this, that more than half, 58%, believe that God accepts the worship of all religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And then, uh, again, another part of the survey says that almost half, 44%, say that Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. Now, remember what I just said about John's Gospel. Those I am statements are Jesus declaring, I am God. Uh, remember, if we go back to Exodus 3.14, uh, which says, I am who I am, uh, God is saying to Moses, uh, that is a declaration of deity, and, and those I am statements are in the context of Jesus declaring, yes, I am the one who has come, and, and who has come to die, and to be buried, and to rise again. Jesus Christ is truly God, and truly man, and he is the only one who can save. And so this is absolutely critical, but but those statistics are concerning, uh, but so is the ones from George Barna. Uh, he does an American inventory of Christian worldview, and he reports that 49% accept reincarnation as a possibility after they die. 35% believe Jesus is the only way to salvation. 27% recognize humans as sinful. And, and, and we can go, uh, on the sinful part, we can go uh, to, uh, for example, Romans 1 through 3. Um, in Romans 3, 23, it says very clearly that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and then uh, Paul gives the gospel in, in Romans 3, 24. And again, in Romans 6, uh, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then Paul gives the gospel. And so it, the, the writers of the, the Word of God are not only concerned to address our sinfulness so that we will see very clearly our need of Jesus, but also they, uh, they take us to um, the sufficiency of Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection to help us to see um, that Jesus Christ is indeed not only meets our need, but he alone um, can satisfy uh, the wrath of God alone because he is truly God and truly man and only he uh, can save. Now, as I'm talking about here, this, this is not only an issue of salvation, uh, the message of salvation and it being restricted and exclusive only to those who repent and believe in Christ alone. This issue is not only an issue with Joel Olstein as, as the statistics I shared show. Um, even in the four walls of our churches, uh, it is a great issue. And we must be clear that there is only one way to God. It is not by your merit. It is not about you being a good person. It is not, uh, as we're about to talk about, how nice you are. Um, it has nothing to do with anything. It has to do with the question, do you see your sin in light of a holy and just God or not? And if not, then be sure that you might be dead in your trespasses and sins and not alive unto God. Paul even talks this way. Um, we were once enemies of God, but now because of the grace of God, um, as Ephesians 2 says, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It, it has nothing at all to us. The only thing Jonathan Edwards said that we contribute is our sin. Uh, but Christ is utterly holy and righteous and perfect and just in all of his ways. And so we can look at John 14, 6. Again, I, Jesus says, this is one of the I am statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to me except, you know, through himself. Uh, Jesus proclaims another one of the I am statements that he is the door. Uh, you can only enter through uh, the door that is Christ himself because only Christ can save. Uh, Acts 4.12, the apostles proclaimed that there is salvation in no other name other than in Jesus Christ alone. And so we have to be crystal 
crystal clear like the Bible is that salvation is restricted and it is exclusive only to those who repent and believe. And so I want to ask you a question here today. Do you think, listeners, um, and, and, I, and I'm not, I'm putting this out there as a question. Do you think that being nice equals being a faithful pastor or a Christian? Now, of all the words in the English language, nice, it serves as a catch-all word when we don't know what to say about something or someone. I mean, let's, let's be honest. Who doesn't want to be called nice, right? But what does it mean to be nice? And is this even a compliment that we as Bible-believing and Bible-shaped uh, Christians should desire? Well, take your Bible and search for the word nice, and guess what? It's not there. So if we look at the root of the word nice, we find that it comes from the late 12th and 13th centuries. Nice, it refers to being careless, clumsy, and weak. Now, looking a bit deeper, we also find nice to have been defined as timid or faint-hearted. Well, that doesn't seem like a descriptor Christians should strive for, right? And according to the definition most people give today, Jesus wouldn't even have been considered nice because people today say Jesus is intolerant but even as they proclaim that he is a good teacher. The, the same Savior who healed the blind man is the same one who cracked a whip and flipped over tables. He is not only the sacrificial lamb, but also the lion of the tribe of Judah. So even when the Bible talks about our attitude, it tells us the fruit of the Spirit in our lives isn't niceness, but kindness. We need to remember that these are the fruits that the Holy Spirit is producing in the life of the born-again Christian. Now, now, kindness is also an attribute of God. The Lord is compassionate, he's faithful, he's just. And now, in the New Testament, we find kindness describing one that's gentle, upright, gracious, and generous. Now, Ephesians tells us that we show kindness by the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through our lives. And so, we extend kindness by the grace and mercy of God. And so, the scriptures implore us to be kind to one another. But kindness isn't weakness, it's not niceness. Kindness is the compassion of God on display through the working of the Spirit in our lives. It takes a working of the Holy Spirit in our lives to show kindness. Now, contrast that idea with niceness, which seeks to please people more than God and models worldly weakness instead of godly strength. So in the pursuit of being nice, we often say yes when we say, should say no. Instead of confronting in love, we take on the burdens of others' mistakes as if they are our own. You know, we can all identify with the idea of being overly nice, correct? You never want to be the person to rock the boat or even hurt somebody's feelings. But our lives in Christ and our ministries suffer when we take the attitude of niceness instead of kindness. So how do we change our thinking on this? Here are three ways that your life can be characterized by godly kindness instead of worldly niceness. First, be clear and direct in your communication. The old saying goes, mean what you say and say what you mean. So if you can't do something, go to a specific event, or even take on a new ministry, be clear about what you're doing. Instead of making that person wait for an answer, tell them directly and be clear about it. Don't be pressured into saying yes when you know that you need to say no. Second, love others by being truthful. When was the last time you lied to a person that you needed to be truthful to? For example, the person who's doing a horrible job that you continually tell they're doing great. Everyone around it, you knows it, and so do you, but instead you say they're doing great. Proverbs 27, 6 tells us, The wounds of a friend are trustworthy, but the kisses of an enemy are excessive. Third, be bold and live to please God alone. You see, you and I, we can't please everyone, and chances are you're going to have to tell somebody no at some point. And you may even feel bad about saying no, but sometimes no is the right and the proper response. And so instead of being fearful, be bold and live for the glory of God alone. Saying yes to everyone isn't the best way to lead. In the end, we aim to glorify God. We most likely won't remove nice from our vocabulary, but we can begin to remove the notion of being nice from our everyday lives. Instead, we should do as Colossians 3.12 says, As God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So, we need to ask the question and return to the point of this episode. What is wrong with your best life now and with Joel's theology? 
Well, as Joel puts it in your best life now, and all these quotes are from uh, your best life now, he says on page 35 of that book, God wants to give you your own house. God has a big dream for your life. The key to realizing that big dream is, according to Joel, to follow his seven steps to living up to your full potential. These seven points that follows are from his book. First, enlarge your vision. Believe that God will make you successful, not saved, not redeemed, not forgiven, just successful. Expect God to do good things for you. Page 41 of his book says, Perhaps you're searching for a parking spot in a crowded lot. Say, Father, I thank you for leading and guiding me. Your favor will cause me to get a good spot. Now, also, expect others to do good things for you. Joel says, I've come to expect to be treated differently, he says. I've learned to expect people to want to help me. My attitude is, I'm a child of the Most High God. My Father created the whole universe. He has crowned me with favor. Therefore, I can expect preferential treatment, as he says in uh, page 39 of his book. And don't think for a second that he's kidding. Second, develop a healthy self-image. After all, just like in the case of Gideon, he says, God sees you as strong and courageous as a man or a woman of great honor and value. So stop thinking of yourself as a loser with a bad job, a small apartment, and a lemon of a car. Start believing that you can become what God says you can become. Take Sarah in the word of God, for example. It took a long time for God to fulfill his promise that she would become pregnant. Well, why so long? He says on page 80, the key to the promise coming to pass was that Sarah had to conceive it in her heart before she was able to conceive it in her physical body. And we all have promises from God, don't we? On page 80, he says, I wonder how many great things God is trying to do in your life. We're just like Sarah. We can't conceive it. We're not in agreement with God, so we're missing out on his blessings. And so he says, start believing. On page 82 through 83, he says, God didn't make you to be average. God created you to excel. And so if you will start acting like it, talking like it, seeing yourself as more than a conqueror, you will live a prosperous and victorious life. Well, third, discover the power of your thoughts and words. If you think negative thoughts all the time, how can you expect the Lord to bless you? But he says also on page 108, when you think positive, excellent thoughts, you'll be propelled towards greatness, inevitably bound for increased promotion and God's supernatural blessings. He says the Bible tells us that what we need to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. If you will transform your mind, God will transform your life. Fourth, he says, let go of the past. You can't live successful and with God's favor all over you if you are bitter and disappointed all the time. You can't unscramble eggs, he says, so just fill your horn with oil like Samuel, which Joel apparently does not realize was to anoint the king and be happy on page 175 and 181 of his book. Uh, point five, find strength through adversity. On page 191, he says, God wants you to be a winner and not a whiner. And so he says, take challenges in your life head on. Don't back down from them because he says on page 217, God has promised that he will turn your challenges into stepping stones for promotion. Point six, live to give. Be compassionate, empathetic, and kind. God has created you to give and whatever wealth, possessions, success he gives to you, he intends for you to use for the the good of other people. Besides, if you plant seed in other people's lives, he says, God will cause there to be a great harvest sometime down the road. And so when a waiter offers to pay for your breakfast in a fancy hotel, even when the breakfast is included in the price of the room and would be free anyway, don't tell him. No, no, better to leave the poor guy in the dark. For as you whisper sagely to your wife, we can't rob him of his blessing. He's planted a seed by doing something good for us. We don't want to pull his seed out of the ground and give it back. Back, Joel says. So let him spend 40 bucks for no reason because you know that when he planted that seed in the ground, God was going to multiply it back to him on page 255 of this book. Now lastly, choose to be happy. Happiness is a choice and so smile a lot and God is going to bless you if you do. Also, become a person of excellence. On page 282, Joel says, God doesn't bless mediocrity. He blesses excellence. And so do you want a new car? Then wash the one you have. You want a bigger house? Uh, he says on page uh, 283, keep it looking nice. Make sure it looks like a person of excellence lives there. If you're going to start taking care of what God has given to you, he'll be more than likely to give you something better on page 283. He says, God has great things in store for you, Joel says, so start living with some enthusiasm. If you will do all these things, follow these seven steps, then on page 306, Joel says, 
God will take you places you've never dreamed of, and you will be living your best life now. Well, what does one say about all of this? Well, there's a lot to say. But first, even if you take Joel's book for what it really is, one more self-help manual focusing on the power of positive thinking, it just doesn't work. Thinking highly of yourself is not a pathway to success. And most of the time, it's a pathway to having your office colleagues talk about you behind your back, right? You don't believe me? Then try it. The next time you go into the office or anywhere, try Joel's tactic of demanding preferential treatment because you're a child of God. Well, I want you to see how far that doesn't take you because it won't take you very far. But more importantly, though, it needs to be said clearly and widely that there's nothing Christian about this book. Yes, Joel Olstein talks about God throughout the book, but it is not the God of the Bible he has in mind. Uh, Joel's God is little more than a mechanism that gives the power to positive thinking. More on that in a minute. But there, we need to say there is no cross in Joel's theology. There is no sin in Joel's theology. And as a result, there is no redemption or salvation or eternity. Even Jesus himself is only mentioned two or three times in Joel's book. And one of those is the punchline of the story about the little tree who has a bad self-esteem until he figures out uh, he is being turned into the cross on which Jesus is to be crucified. That story may have Jesus' name in it, but it's not a story of about Jesus. It, like the rest of the book, is a story about feeling good about yourself. And so if Joel wants to be the Norman Vincent Peale of the 21st century, he has every right to give it a shot. But he should stop marketing his message as Christianity because it's not. You cannot simply make reference to God, quote some scripture, call what you're saying spiritual principles, and pass it off as biblical Christianity. That's the kind of thing that will have people enlarging their vision and choosing to be happy all the way to hell, a place of unending, unrelenting, conscious punishment. Now, the really frightening thing is that 8 million people, as of this recording, have bought your best life now. And a good portion of those have probably walked away thinking that they've read and heard the Christian gospel. They think they understand the message of the Bible, and it's me, my success, my self-esteem, my house, my car, my promotion. And if that is what is passing for Christianity today, then the need for the true gospel is more than severe. Someone needs to tell these people, even if they are not inclined to hear, even if it's over the head of their own quote-unquote pastors, that the gospel is not collaborating with God to make yourself successful. It is not about getting more stuff and being more prosperous. It is about God forgiving people for their sin through the death of his son, bringing them to life from the spiritual dead, and conforming them to the image of Jesus Christ alone. Your Best Life Now quickly debuted on the New York Times list of bestsellers and remained there for more than two years. By December, just three months after its release, Your Best Life Now had tallied over 500,000 sales, and it was awarded the Golden Book Award. In May 2005, it achieved 1 million sales and received the Platinum Book Award. Award. To date, it has sold over 8 million copies. Now, Joel's book was widely criticized by Christian leaders for ignoring the gospel of salvation through Christ's atoning sacrifice in favor of a gospel of financial and life-wide prosperity. And while Joel claimed to be teaching biblical principles, he was instead picking and choosing isolated verses of the Bible to teach self-empowerment uh, such as Norman Vincent Peale and so many others had done before him. Now, Your Best Life Now catapulted Joel to new heights of exposure and influence at the time of its release. Barbara Walters declared him to be one of the 10 most fascinating people of 2006. And in that same year, readers of Church Report magazine named him the most influential Christian in 2006. He was invited to make many appearances on television programs, including 60 Minutes, and he made much publicized visits to Oprah Winfrey and Larry King. Now, he also began to travel extensively and internationally for sold-out events called A Night of Hope. Today, Lakewood Church meets in what used to be the Compact Center, the 16,000-seat former home of the Houston Rockets. Nearly 40,000 people plus attend each week, making Lakewood Church America's largest congregation. And since your best life now, Joel has offered several other books, most of which had appeared on the list of bestsellers. They include Become a Better You, It's Your Time Now, Every Day of Friday, I Declare, and Break Out, and more of his titles which have become bestsellers. So now we're going to see in this next clip. 
We're going to hear Joel Olstein sit with Oprah. We're going to see him receiving accolades nicely and smilingly leading an eager crowd farther and farther down the road and away from the cross. And he's nice too. But he too will nice you straight to the gates of hell, flashing that brilliant smile all the while. You know, I declare that if you, if you were to do the declarations for 31 days, your life would change. That's what you did it for, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. One, yes. day, one day a month, and you know, you can continue to do them, but it's a great start. You can watch Pastor Joel's entire I Am Sermon. We have it on Oprah.com. Final thoughts from you, Pastor Joel. Well, I think it's just so important to never speak negative words about yourself, your family. You know, it may come to your mind, but don't give your words life by speaking them out. Don't ever say anything negative about yourself. You may feel it, but just, you know, zip it up and, and make those positive declarations. It takes time, though, because from the time I heard the I Am sermon, I mean, I, what it did, and I'm hoping this is what's going to happen for all of you who are watching, who are here, is that you start catching yourself. Because, you know, if you're however old you are, you have the habit of feeding the negative tapes to yourself. Mm -hmm. I do, too. And so when you first catch yourself doing it, you switch it, just as we've been doing here today. You switch the I am, and it takes practice. That's why the I declare, the declarations, help you get into the practice of it. Absolutely, and it's not something you go out and have to do in public. You, you get up in the morning, you're in the shower, you're driving to work saying, you know what, Lord, thank you, I'm, I'm strong. I make good decisions, I'm healthy. Just simple things like that. It's I'm just... looking forward to my future. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm perfect. looking forward to my future, yeah. yes. Yeah. Could you lead us in a few I am's today? Absolutely. Okay. Can we all stand? Can we all stand? All right, let's stand. All right. All right. Just repeat after me. I am strong. I am strong. I am healthy. I am healthy. I am confident. I am confident. I am secure. I am secure. I am talented. I am talented. I am creative. I am creative. I am disciplined. I am disciplined. I am focused. I am focused. I am valuable. I am valuable. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. I am blessed. I am excited about my future. I'm excited about my future. I am victorious. I am victorious. All right. How about Thank you, you Now, as Christians, we are called to stand firm on what the Bible says, no matter how countercultural it is, and no matter how odious it is to the spirit of the age. Now, as Christians, we do need to take, as 2 Corinthians uh, 10 tells us to do, we are to take every thought captive into the obedience of Christ. We are to do, as Philippians 4, 8 says, and to think on what is noble, good, pure, and lovely as revealed in the Word of God. But we do not do that principally to tell us how good we are and how wonderful we are and how uh, prosperous we're going to be. And instead, we do these things, we do biblical meditation to remind ourselves of who God is and what God is like and what Christ has done on our behalf. We, we do, we take our hand, ourselves in the hand of biblical meditation and we're reminding ourselves of the truth of what God has said to us uh, about himself in his revealed word. This isn't about me and mine as we just saw Joel do. This is about God reminding ourselves of our need for God. And God is telling us in his revealed and sufficient word that he is enough for us. And so uh, this, this is totally the opposite of what God does in his word. So when Christians do this, we are so often portrayed as unpleasant or even disagreeable, the very opposite of nice. We need to allow ourselves to be portrayed as not nice. We can't afford to allow niceness to be a fruit of the Spirit along with the rest. It may even be impossible to be nice when we stand with firm conviction of what the Bible says about marriage, about the value of the unborn, or any area of life where culture conflicts with the Word of God. We need to be okay with that as long as the fruit of the Spirit is present in its place if we are to be nice at all we must first be full of love patience kindness gentleness self-control and the other character qualities that are genuinely reflective of the spirit as revealed in galatians 5 22 through 23 now we need to say that niceness is not a bad trait 
but it is not wrong or sinful to be nice. But we vastly overestimate it and at the same time confuse it with those traits that matter so much more. It may be good to be nice, but it is so much better to be holy. So as we do at the end of these episodes, we must talk about how should we as Christians think and respond to what we've heard today. And the first thing is very clearly, personally, you and I must be daily delighting in the word of God, to, delighting to read and study it and meditate on it and, and for the spirit to apply it to our lives. We must delight and long to be under uh, biblically qualified pastors who are going to preach from the whole counsel of God uh, to teach us to be instructed and to do life with God's people. Uh, we must insist that our pastors preach from the whole Bible and be biblically qualified. Um, that this is the reason why we have uh, the biblical and theological illiteracy in our day. And I, and I want to plead with you today, dear Christian. Refuse to be at a church where the pastor will not preach the whole Bible and only preaches, uh, you know, uh, or even cherry picks at worst passages from the Bible and to feed the flock. No, what, what the flock needs is they need rich teaching from the Word of God, verse by verse and line by line. Now, now there's not a problem time to time for there to be a topical series, but even the very topical series that is preached, as one who does pulpit supply, I can say that uh, even the topical sermon, the occasional sermon or whatever, that sermon should still be expository in nature. It should be have as its focus a particular text or text and then expositing those texts, not just running to a verse, opening up the Bible and saying, boop, there's, this is the text that I'm going to preach on, like I'm treating the Bible like it's a genie in a bottle and you're just going to you know, rub, rub, open your Bible and rub it and you're going to get your magic verse that that God says no what you're going to get is you're going to get the wrong interpretation because you haven't understood the context and the meaning of that passage and then you're never going to get to the right uh, uh, application of that passage because you never got to the right interpretation of the passage and that is such an important thing to say uh, and this is why uh, we're having these types of episodes is because you have teachers like Joel and many others like him who, who are aiming for you to have your best life here and now instead of we are we are here we are to preach the gospel glad tidings of good news but first that message includes that we are sinners we are lawbreakers in need of rescue and that christ has come in that rescue to save sinners as luke 19 10 very clearly says that jesus came to seek and to save the lost jesus has come to seek and to save the lost. He has come to satisfy the wrath of God. And he has done that in his death, burial, and resurrection to give us new life in his name. And through the through his death and resurrection, Jesus gives us a new identity. He gives us new meaning. He gives us new purpose. And he gives us a new mission in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He indwells us by his spirit. He empowers us by his spirit to go make disciples who make disciples of the nations for the glory and honor of God alone. And so we don't have a message that is about our best life now or any such thing. Instead, what we have is a message that addresses the reality of our sin. We are sinners by nature and by choice, and what we need is the rescue that only Jesus Christ can provide. And that, that is true for the lost, those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. And so if that's you, I urge you, I plead with you right now on the basis of Acts 16.31 to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be saved. And, and to stop following, stop following and giving money to uh, people and teachers like Joel Olstein. They are poisonous charlatans. And nothing more and nothing less than that. They will lead you down the primrose path of destruction. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to use an example here. In Pilgrim's Progress, Christian has, uh, gets off and veers off the path many, many times. And there's a man, um, a character in the story of Pilgrim's Progress called Evangelist. And Evangelist reminds Christian uh, of the glories of Christ. In this episode, I'm going to be like Christian. 
I'm, I'm reminding you of the glories of Christ because we are all prone to veer off the path. And maybe that's you today. You veered off the path uh, of, of what God has said in his word. And, and what you must do is you must recognize that there is only one way to God. There is only one way to God in that only Christ can truly save. And if you're not a Christian, I plead with you. I plead with you. I beg you to repent and to believe and stop following teachers like Joel Olstein, who are going to lead you down that path of destruction that Christian was once on. Instead, I urge you to repent and to believe and to cast yourself on the perfect spotless righteousness that is in Christ alone. You see, only Christ can save. And this is why, dear Christian, we must never, never be satisfied with teaching that, that only is fluff. We must never be satisfied with teaching like that of Joel Olstein and his followers and teachers like him because it, they don't end up helping us. They, they leave us at best, at best, and most charitably speaking. They leave us stuck in the milk and not growing in the meat and in the knowledge and growing in skill and handling of the word of God. That is why you must personally be reading and studying your Bible. That is why you, as a Christian, must be under biblically sound and theologically qualified male, biblically qualified local church pastors or, or pastors, plural, preferably a plurality of elders in your local church. This is why um, you should refuse to be satisfied with just the status quo in your Christian life. You should instead be growing in maturity. And this is for a lifetime. This is in the here and now. While, while we're here, we should all, no matter how long you've been a Christian, we should all be growing. And so this is why we need to do life with one. You look at the, for example, you look at the, the Pauline epistles, minus Philemon, they are all written to local churches and where people are gathering and doing life with one another. Um, you also have the one another passages, the some 50 of them in the, in the New Testament. And what these, these one another passages teach us is they teach us about what life is to look like with one another as Christians in the local church. And so I want to plead with you, as if you're a Christian, don't do life alone. Don't do your life with alone, with, with just apart from the church. Do your life with the church. You were saved uh, for a purpose. You were saved not to do life alone. You were saved to do life with other Christians. And so do life with others in your local church. And get mentored, get discipled one-on-one, -on -one, and join a small group in your local church. And I want to plead with you as the last point in this podcast. Refuse to be biblically and theologically illiterate any longer. Please find solid local church pastors, biblically qualified pastors. Uh, listen to teachers and podcasters um, that are sound in their doctrine and theology. And start supporting their ministry financially. Uh, share their podcasts. Share their, share their books. Uh, buy their books. Support authors that refuse to bow the knee to the spirit of the age, but who are standing on the word of God alone and on what the church has taught. And, you know, by, by God's kindness and grace, um, we have been doing this now. Uh, Servants of Grace turns uh, 24 years old in, in August, and we're going to just continue on. You know, um, I, am, I, am, I am desperately committed, um, passionately committed to finish my race well and, and to see the Lord honored and glorified uh, for the rest of my days. And so I, I want to encourage you when we have somebody on, please check out their podcast, check out their books, check out their website. Um, you know, uh, we have book recommendations on our magazine, Theology for Life. I want to encourage you to check out that. Uh, we, we've been doing that now 10 years. Um, so I want to thank you for listening or watching this episode of Contending for the Word. Friends, Let's stand on the word. Let's contend for the word. Once and for all, delivered to the saints. Let's do it with gentleness and respect. And let's do, correct opponents with gentleness for the honor and glory of God alone. And, and God will use us to make disciples who make disciples uh, to uh, see the saints matured and the lost saved for the honor and glory of God alone. Well, I want to thank you once again for listening or watching this episode of Contending for the Word. Until next time, may God bless you and keep you. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of Contending for the Word. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to also like, subscribe, and follow Servants of Grace on Facebook, Instagram, or X. We appreciate your support.